Oh, good morning. Very appropriate song choice. Seems like that's happened a couple times now uh, when I've been visiting. But that song that we just sang is a very good segue into the lesson that we want to look at together this morning. We sang about the last mile of the way and all that awaits those that are faithful to Christ through that last mile. Being in a place where there is no more suffering, no more difficulty, no more tears. Uh, it's a wonderful thing to think about and I hope that that is where your mind was as we sang that song together. But before we get to the last mile, we have to go through the rest of the journey. And the title of our lesson this morning is Life is a Highway. I always, one of my favorite exercises, I guess, just within my own mind. As I go about from day to day, I like to think about just everyday things and how they can relate to spiritual lessons. You know, things that we might go through or things we might interact with from day to day that on the surface just seem like mundane things, but when you really sit and ponder them and think about them, you can make some kind of a spiritual application. And of course, that's not some kind of revolutionary idea. Uh, throughout the scriptures, that's exactly what inspired men did. It's what Jesus did. As he taught the various parables, he would look out uh, on the scene there as he was teaching and say, look at the sower over here sowing the seed, for example. Something they were familiar with seeing uh, most days of their lives. They knew all about that process. Many of them themselves were sowers of seed, farmers. And he would use that everyday experience to then teach them spiritual lessons. And so as you think about the idea of driving down the road in a car, which is something we all do, pretty sure we all got here to this place this morning by doing that very thing, I think there are a lot of lessons that we can draw, a lot of applications that we might make to spiritual things. Various places in Scripture talk about this life that we live for a short time on earth as uh, a journey down a road. We might think about what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, just a couple verses here, where he talks about the contrast between the narrow way and the broad, easy way, both of them being roads that a person might travel down. He says, enter by the narrow gate, there at verse 13, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. Jesus, in John chapter 14 and verse 6, as he was responding to his disciple there, says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So, he speaks about following him and abiding in his teaching as traveling on the way, on the road, we might say, that leads to eternal life. We want to have access to God. We want to be with God, the Father, throughout eternity. Then we must follow the road that he has paved for us to follow. In 1 Corinthians Chapter 9, the Apostle Paul here, writing, talks about life as running a race. And of course, we can relate that back to um, the roadway as well. Several uh, forms of entertainment that we've come up with involve racing cars down a road, right? But he says there, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? And so run in such a way that you may obtain it. Everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we, we are running 
for an imperishable crown, for eternal life. And so as he speaks to his audience here, really you and I are his audience even today, uh, he doesn't exclude anybody from running this race. He says you're all running the race, but the question is how are you going to run it? Are you going to run it on the path that's going to lead you to your desired destination? Are you going to run in such a way that you stay on that path? Or are you going to venture off here, venture off there? Remember Jesus said, wide and broad is the way that many choose to follow that leads them only to destruction. So we see this analogy as something that um, is brought out in, in various different places. And of course we could look at even more examples if we wanted to take the time, but for sake of our lesson here, we'll look at just a few. Now, as you think about driving down the road, one thing that is prevalent, that sometimes we don't really think too much about, but nonetheless, we see all kinds of different signs. Uh, when we leave here in just a little while, the Lord wills, you're going to pull out, and as you start to go down the road, you're going to immediately start to see all kinds of signs all along the roadway there. And these signs are put up for the purpose of guiding us where we want to go, and not only where we want to go, but in a safe manner. For example, we see these kinds of signs all the time, don't we? Speed limit sign. You're allowed to go up until this speed, don't go over that speed, because as we've deemed it, we might argue with the authorities sometimes, right? Why is it only 25 through here? That doesn't make any sense. But nonetheless, somebody has looked at that stretch of road and they've said, well, you know, probably the safest speed that you'd want to drive this stretch of road is, you know, whatever it is. And so we put that on a sign, we put that up there. But the idea is that we would be safe. You know, you don't want to go on this curvy road going 90 where you can very easily lose control and, and hurt yourself or hurt somebody else. Sometimes we might see signs that tell us to slow down, even below what the recommended speed limit is. You know, you're going through a neighborhood there, and it's a reminder that, hey, children are out here playing in the street sometimes, so please go slowly. Please make sure that you're aware of your surroundings. And you know, God, in his word, gives us signs similar to this. Uh, instructions so as to be safe and not cause ourselves harm in a spiritual sense. Uh, just notice a couple examples here with me. James chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift <coughs> to hear. Sometimes we do need to speed up a little bit, right? As we're getting on to the interstate, right, we have to merge in with the traffic that's going faster than what we are at that uh, at that period of time, and so we have to speed up so as to merge in and be safe. But also, be slow to speak. Be slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So for some things we need to be quick, right? But other things we need to be slow. We need not to get ahead of ourselves and let emotions take control. We'll kind of circle back to that idea here in a little bit. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3 there, beginning. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. The idea that we be set apart to be holy as God is holy. Well, how do we do that? Well, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel, think about your own body is the kind of the idea there, to know how to control yourself, in other words, in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust. The passion of lust, think about that as the guy that's just flooring it down the highway. He doesn't care what the speed limit is. He's just giving in to the thrill of the speed. That's the idea of the passion of lust, right? Like the Gentiles who do not know God. We can very easily give in to our passions, and we can drive recklessly. And perhaps sometimes we do that very thing and, and have done that in the past. But 
Again, we see these warnings that God has given us in his word to show us when it's appropriate to go this speed, when it's appropriate to slow down and, and take our time and be careful. Sometimes we see signs that warn us that there's danger ahead, blasting zone ahead. I'm not really sure what exactly that is. You know, <laughs> I see those signs sometimes. And, uh, it is kind of frightening when you see that. Well, what's that mean? Are we going to be going through like a war zone up here? Are there bombs going on? But we have these warnings to maybe perhaps even avoid certain places, right? Sometimes there's, there's whole roads that are just blocked off, you know, road closed. Don't go here. It's not safe. 2 Timothy 2, verse 22. Flee youthful lust, but pursue righteousness and faith and love. Pursue peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Sometimes we have to just altogether avoid a certain uh, a pathway that is certain to lead us to, uh, to destruction. Uh, but nonetheless, in, in connection with these warnings against what not to do or uh, when to slow down, etc., you notice that we also have these instructions as to what we should do, the appropriate course of action. As he says here, flee these things, but pursue these other things. Now, another thing you see as you're driving down the road, you see all kinds of advertisements, don't you? All kinds of billboards that are designed to catch our attention and intrigue us. You know, you're driving down the interstate and you see that big golden arch up on the sign and you think, man, yeah, I could go for some McDonald's right now and pull off the road and take a little detour. <laughs> some people shaking their heads. <laughs> Maybe you're not a fan of McDonald's. Well, that's probably a good thing. It's not really that great for you. <laughs> you that. But that kind of illustrates the point, though, doesn't it? Because many of these things that are trying to get our attention, trying to get us to pull off the road and go over here for a little while and take this little detour, it's really not in our best interest to do so. Satan loves to put billboards all along the roadway that leads to life because he wants us to get off of that road. He doesn't want us to stay on that straight, narrow way. He wants us to detour over here, get back on the broad, wide interstate that everybody else is traveling on. Why should you be over here off-roading it and, you know, risking damage in your tire or, you know, messing up this or mess? You know, that's difficult. Why don't you come back over here where it's nice and easy? Look how many other people are doing. Look at all the fun they're having. Right? Isn't that exactly how Satan works? Back in Proverbs chapter 1, passage here I think lines up with this idea quite well. We understand that in uh, the book of Proverbs here, especially in these early chapters, it's the idea of wisdom speaking to us and giving us instruction. And so verse 10 there, it says, My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie in wait to shed blood. Let us lurk secretly for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them alive like Sheol and whole like those who go down to the pit. We shall find all kinds of precious possessions. We'll fill our houses with spoil. Cast in your lot among us and let us all have one purse. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your foot from their path, for their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed blood. Surely, in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird, but they lie in wait for their own blood. They lurk secretly for their own lives. In other words, the things they're doing, these traps they're setting for other people so that they might enrich themselves, uh, they're, they're basically just ensnaring their own souls and destroying themselves. He says, verse 19, So are the ways of everyone who is greedy for gain. It takes away the life of its owners. And so here we see this very uh, idea explained in Scripture where you're going to be going along and there's going to be people over here, hey, come with us and do this. Hey, why don't you come over here and try this out? We're going to have all kinds of fun. We're going to get all kinds of riches, right? But he says, don't listen to them. 
You just keep moving straight ahead the way that you know you want to go. As you're driving down the road, there's also hazards from time to time. How many times have you been driving down? Maybe it's kind of starting to get dark out. Maybe evening's already come, and all of a sudden in your headlights, you see this little guy staring at you. <laughs> right? Those big deer eyes illuminated by your headlights, and you're, oh. Sometimes they just jump out right at the most inopportune moment, right? And you have to hit the brakes, swerve, try not to hit them. But sometimes we have these things that pop up in life that are hazardous. Whether it's we lose something dear to us, you know, so many people struggle when a loved one is lost, or maybe you lose your job, or, you know, all a number of things we might think about. Some kind of natural disaster happens and your house catches fire and burns down. And we can think about all kinds of different examples, these hazardous things that come and then challenge our faith. And we start to think, well, why am I even on this road to begin with? It would be so much easier to go and live this way or that way. Does God even care about me? Is he even there? 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, Peter writes, he's writing to Christians here, keep this in mind. He says, Beloved, don't think it's strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing has happened to you. But rather rejoice. He says, to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Peter explains here that just because we choose to be Christians doesn't mean that we're guaranteed some smooth sailing life that just glides us right into heaven. <laughs> In fact, it's oftentimes the opposite, where because we've chosen to go against the world, to not go with the flow and run with the crowd to oppose the adversary that seeks nothing but to destroy our soul and spirit in hell, that life becomes actually more difficult for us sometimes. And it seems like more hazards are popping up in the roadway than they were before. But Peter says, don't think that's strange and, and don't be destroyed or, or discouraged by that, but rather rejoice because you think about the life that we're emulating, the life of Christ, and how much suffering did he endure, but ultimately he has been raised to the right hand of the glory of God and has promised us that same result, that we will endure the sufferings and difficulties of life and keep our faith. In the end, we will have that crown of life that has been promised to each of us. And sometimes the hazards that we experience are other people. <laughs> somebody breaks unexpectedly. Somebody cuts us off. Right? All these different kinds of things, and, and we can just feel that road rage building within us. We want to honk the horn. We want to get up ahead of them and then cut them off right in return. Right? We want to retaliate some way. Tempted to scream things out of our windows or shake our fists at people. But people, just like you and I, they have free will. And oftentimes, sadly, they choose to do things that they shouldn't do. They can hurt us. They can betray us. They can lie about us. They can just outright be hateful towards us. And we've all experienced these things. But that can be a hazard to our faith. That can challenge our faith. Will we be patient and loving even in the light of hatefulness and people trying to abuse us in some way? It's, it's not an easy thing to do. It's easy to talk about it. It's easy to say, well, that's what we should do. But then, you know, putting it into actual practice is often quite challenging. 2 Timothy chapter 2 here, verse 15, Paul wrote to Timothy and said, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing or handling the word of truth. But he says, shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. 
And he says, Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past. And notice he says they overthrow the faith of some. So here we see a, an actual example of some individuals who, because of their false teaching, they had overthrown the faith of, of certain people who had started to follow after them and, and get caught up in their, their deception. Maybe you've experienced this, where you're going down the road and you're just kind of following whoever it is. Maybe you're on the interstate. It's easy to do on the interstate, in my experience. So you're just kind of traveling along and all of a sudden you kind of glance down at your how fast you're going and it can be one of two things. Either one, you're going like 15 over the speed limit and you're like, whoa, what? what's going on here? You didn't even notice because, well, I'm just following this guy ahead of me. Or maybe this is more so my experience. I get yelled at by my wife a lot. Where I'll be going like 10 under the speed limit and she's like, why are you following this guy? Why don't you go around him and I don't know, I'm just, just driving along, not paying attention, you know, my mind somewhere else. But that's just an illustration of how easy it is for others to influence us. Think about that. And apply that just to your life in general, where you're going along and, well, well, my friend is doing this, and I trust him. He's been my friend for 20 years. So I've just kind of been going along, never really thought about what we were doing or whether it was right or wrong, but... Now that I kind of think about it a little more uh, carefully, maybe we shouldn't be doing this. Or maybe this is something I need to think about, right? We can be influenced so easily by other people and not even really notice it until perhaps we're in a situation that uh, is less than desirable. So we have to be careful. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 33 reminds us not to be deceived because evil company corrupts good habits. Who we surround ourselves with, whether we want to accept it or not, does ultimately influence us. And if we choose to be surrounded by the wrong people or influenced by the wrong sources, we can very easily be influenced in the wrong way. Sometimes you're driving down the road and you see one of these up ahead. Oftentimes you don't see them. That's the trouble, right? These potholes, things that just take us off guard. It's always kind of funny because you, you hit one of those things the wrong way and it's like we wince as though it hurt us physically. <laughs> we're just almost like we're personifying the car as though we just hurt the car's you know, feelings somehow by running over that pothole. Uh, but nonetheless, just another illustration of how it can be dangerous, it can be difficult as we go through this life. There's things that hit us unexpectedly. Maybe it's a temptation that you know, we, we thought we were on guard and it just came at, it, at us at just the right angle. And suddenly we're, whoa, where did this come from? And we, we get caught up in something we shouldn't. Jeremiah 18 and verse 15, going back to the Old Testament there. The prophet writes, he says, Because my people have forgotten me, conveying obviously the, the thoughts of God here. Because my people have forgotten me, they have burned incense to worthless idols. And they've caused themselves, notice, to stumble in their ways from the ancient paths, to walk in pathways and not on a highway. So here we, we have the idea of people that are um, unexpectedly, you know, stumbling because they are uh, tempted to do this or that or to stray from the path that God has outlined for them to walk upon. And it's to, like we said in so many of these other passages, to their own destruction. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. And that just kind of circling back to that whole, you know, hole in the road. It's often, when we least expect it, just out of nowhere, you just, you hit something, and what was that? Right? And maybe it's just because we weren't looking or we weren't paying attention. But it's just so... Um, it lines up so well with, with just living through our lives and how things hit us unexpectedly. We have to, to always be watching and never get complacent. What about the idea of backseat drivers? Have you ever dealt with one of those? 
Or maybe they're not in the back seat, but they're right here next to you <laughs> in the car. All right, somebody who, even though you're the one in control of the vehicle, they are trying to control the vehicle nonetheless. Well, why'd you turn there? Well, why are you going so fast? Why aren't you passing this guy? You know, just there's always these little critiques just coming at us, and we just love that, don't we? It's our favorite thing. <laughs> but normally we're quite irritated by that, aren't we? Well, I want us to think about ourselves for just a minute as backseat drivers. You know, what do I mean by that? Well, kind of to borrow from a song that became popular, it's probably been, I don't know how many years ago it came out now. Um, but nonetheless, you probably know the song, Jesus Take the Wheel. And it's this song about, you know, this girl's going through life and she's just struggling with all these different things and she's, she can't do it. Jesus, you take the wheel. I trust your guide. It's a, it's a good song. It has a good message. So it's not a knock against the song at all, but rather I use that to get us to think a little bit about ourselves. Supposedly, when we became a Christian, we in essence are, we, we told Jesus to come up to the driver's seat. Jesus, I want you to pilot me through this life. I want you to guide my every thought, my every decision, my every action. I want you to control the car, in essence. <laughs> But how many times do we find ourselves, Jesus, why are you driving so slow? Jesus, why don't you pull off here and, and, and stop in at this, uh, this restaurant? I'm, I'm hungry. You know, why, why don't we do this? Why don't we do that? Why? We're always critiquing. <laughs> in other words, the way Jesus is piloting us. And we become these backseat drivers where, you know, why don't, yeah, Jesus, just let me, can I just reach up and take the wheel for a minute? Just... I just want to adjust this or that. We just, we're trying to, we want them to be in control, but maybe not all the time, right? <laughs> maybe we want to do the, uh, oh, what do you call that when you get out of the car and you run around the car and switch seats? I can't think of the term now. It'll come to me as soon as this lesson is over. But we want to switch seats and take control again for just, for just a little bit, then you can get back in there and drive. Galatians 2 and verse 20, this, this reminds us of the way it should be. Paul is conveying here. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but rather Christ lives in me. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith, through faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is the, the proper attitude where we're no longer trying to be in control, but we want to give ourselves fully unto him because we know that he has our best interest in mind. Similar bodies conveyed here in Philippians 1 and verse 21, for to me, to live is Christ. Now that's, that's the definition of life is Jesus Christ. He is the answer to every question. He is the consultant to every decision that must be made. And thus, if we live in such a way, we understand that to die then is gain for us because we go on to eternal life with him. I heard a preacher uh, give this illustration once, and it stuck with me, and I think it's very, very good. Because so often our problem is that we, we let our emotions take control of us. Now, the thing about our emotions, they're built in. In other words, we're born with the capacity to be angry. We're born with the capacity to be impatient or any other thing you might fill in the blank there. Any of these emotions, sorrow, happiness, it's all part of who we are as a human being. God's designed us this way. So you might think about it as being in the car, supposedly you're driving, but you've got all these passengers in the car. You can't kick them out. It's not like you can just kick anger out and say, I don't want you in my life anymore. No, he's always going to be there. But the problem we get into so often is that we're driving down and all of a sudden there's some kind of problem that's up ahead in the road. And our rational brain, the part that should be in control, that hopefully we've educated with God's word as to 
how to navigate and how to control this vehicle successfully to our destination. It says, well, this is probably what we should do here, but then who's yelling at us from the back seat? Well, whether it might be anger. Well, that makes me angry. Let me up there. I'll take control for a little bit. Or one of our other emotions that wants to get elevated and say, well, let me take control. I know what to do here. And so we can't kick them out of the car, but the, prop, the thing we have to learn to do is to keep them in their designated seats. So we're going to be influenced by our emotions, and that's actually not a bad thing. When you look at Jesus, when he went into the temple and saw all the defilement that was going on, he became angry, and, and rightfully so in that circumstance. That then motivated him to flip some tables over and cast some people out of there. So there's times where our emotions should influence our decision making, but the problem is, or the, the thing about it is that we can't let the emotion actually take control of the car. That's when we get into problems. And so that flows very nicely into this whole idea here of letting Jesus supposedly take the wheel, but then again, sometimes we want to wrestle him for control. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, it says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes, but fear the Lord and depart from evil. So, again, we must be committed to always allowing Jesus to influence our decisions, not just most of them or some of them, but all of them. And so, brings us to our our last point here, 10 and 2. You hear that when you're learning to drive, probably remember that. Keep your hands up here at 10 and 2, right, as if it's a clock, the steering wheel is a clock. That's where you have the most control over the, the vehicle. That's what we want to maintain as we're trying to get to heaven. We want to stay in control. And, you know, if you're like me, when you first started out, you probably maintained that 10 and 2 for a little while. But then as time went on, well, now it's just 6 o'clock with two fingers on the wheel. And we're just kind of heading down the interstate, not really thinking too much about it, right? We got so used to driving this car that... We don't have to be as cautious as we once were, or so we think. But really, that's a, that's a poor way to, to think about it. And especially in a spiritual sense. Um, sometimes we can get very lax, right? We start off, we first obey the gospel, we're very serious, very motivated. We want to do this the right way. And eh, then the years go on, and maybe we lose some of that zeal. We... We just don't quite care as much because, well, what's the use? People are going to do what they want to do anyway. Why should I say anything? You know, we, we just kind of get complacent and we stop being as diligent as we should be to drive as we ought to. But obviously the encouragement that we get from Scripture is to avoid that kind of mentality, but to stay focused. So we read in 1 Corinthians 9 earlier about this idea of running this race and striving for this imperishable crown. And coming back to that same context there and picking up where we left off, verse 26, <coughs> Paul says, Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. I fight thus, not as one who beats the air, which is a funny illustration for you to stop and think about that, what he says there. It's the idea of a, a boxer. Well, if a boxer goes out there in the ring and he's just swinging his arms this way and that way, very undisciplined, not, not using any kind of methodology or, or discipline to what he's doing, well, yeah, you're beating the air up pretty good, but your opponent's going to come in there and with a calculated jab knock you out. And so he says, I don't fight that way. You know, I don't exercise my faith that way where I'm just hoping something lands. No, I, I discipline myself, I practice, I train so that I know exactly when to throw the jab and exactly when to throw that uppercut or whatever it is so that I can be successful. I discipline my body, he says, verse 27. 
I bring it into subjection. That's the way you have to think about your body. It's like, just like a car. That car is going to do exactly what you tell it to do. I remember one time when I was coming home, this was back when I was in high school. I had a job, well, maybe college. I had a job a couple of towns over at a little pizza place, and so a lot of times I'd be pretty late when I'd get off work and have to drive kind of on these back roads back home. And this one time I was coming home, I was almost home, and all of a sudden I'm, you know, I'm tired and I just look up and I notice this raccoon's wandered up into the road and uh, I just, by impulse, just went like this, meaning just to kind of swerve out of the way, but I had, I had overreacted to the point where my car was suddenly going, you know, off to the side, I almost, almost had an accident, I was able to get back on the road, but that's always stuck with me. Um, we have to stay disciplined. We have to keep control of our vessel. Don't just be wild out here flailing about. Lest, as he ends the thought there, when I preach to others, I myself should become disqualified. <coughs> so stay focused on what you're doing. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 3 here. The Hebrew writer, as he writes, says, Therefore, we also, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, thinking back to the previous chapter there, chapter 11, where you just list all those heroes of faith, right? By faith, Noah, by faith, Abraham, and so forth. We're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, all these people who successfully navigated the road. They've made it to the destination. They're witnesses of the victory of faith. And so let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, notice that, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, who despised the shame, and is now sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. There's the, there's the answer to how, how do I fight against this weariness in my soul and this just feeling defeated and so forth? Well, focus on Jesus Christ. He's your perfect example. He's the one that reminds you of the price that was paid to even put you on the road to begin with and give you a chance to get to where God desires for you to be. Consider all that he went through. And then look at his success and then emulate that success. That's the key to, to making it to victory in the end. You know, we, can't, we can't spend all of our time looking backwards. You know, we have mirrors in the car, right, to show us what's going on around us. Side mirrors, rear view mirror. We have to be able to reference what's back there. And you think about that in the context of life. We have to learn lessons from the, the past. We have to be able to reference things that have gone on, right? Not repeat the same mistakes over and over again, so forth. But you can't just stare in the rearview mirror and drive down the road to where you're going. And you've got to look out ahead of you. Philippians 3, this is the attitude Paul had. Verse 12, beginning there, he says, Not that I've already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, I forget those things that are behind, and I reach forward or strain forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. We cannot spend all of our time looking backwards. We have to look ahead and, and strain forward, as Paul says here, to the goal. Proverbs 4, verses 26 and 27, says, Ponder the path of your feet. Let all your ways be established. Do not turn to the right or the left. And kind I'm of thinking back to those distractions and things. They want us to veer off from the right course, but... The admonition here is to not turn to the right or the left, to remove your foot from evil. Proverbs 12 and verse 28, And the way of righteousness is life, and in its pathway there is 
no death. So how are you doing this morning on your journey down the road? That is where we want to conclude today. How is your journey going? Maybe this morning, as you think about where you are in life, you're, you're broken down on the side of the road. Maybe you, uh, you have wrecked yourself, so to speak. And maybe this morning is the opportunity to get some help with that. To have the tow truck come and, and get you back on the road again. If you wrecked yourself spiritually and you need help this morning, would you allow us to help you? Maybe you have this little light on your dashboard. You ever seen that light before? That's one of the most fun lights to pop up on your car because it can mean so many things. <laughs> but something's wrong, no doubt about it, unless there's just some weird malfunction. But typically it designates that something somewhere in there, something needs some attention. And maybe that's where you are this morning. Maybe you're not completely wrecked on the side of the road, but maybe there's some things that you've identified, you know, they, they need some attention. Maybe it's to the point where that attention um, needs to be the help of your brethren and praying for you about it, praying with you about it. I'll leave you with this final passage, and then the lesson will be yours. Mark chapter 10, verse 46 there. We read about how they came to Jericho, and as Jesus went out of Jericho with his disciples, a great multitude, Blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out. And he said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many were warning him to be quiet. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man. And they said, be of good cheer. Rise, he's calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said, What do you want me to do? <coughs> the blind man said to him, Rabbi, please let me receive my sight. And Jesus said, Go your way, your faith has made you well. Immediately, it says he received his sight, and he followed Jesus on the road. I thought that that final sentence there played so well into thoughts we've been looking at this morning. If you spiritually need attention, need help this morning, Jesus is willing to help you, and we are willing to help you, so that you can get back on the road and you can follow Jesus on the road and make heaven your home someday. So as we now open up our songbooks to sing this song of invitation, there would be one here who needs to take advantage of this time, ask for prayers, or perhaps uh, perhaps you never obeyed the gospel. We would love to assist you with these things uh, as we stand and as we sing.